Hello and welcome to another Long Lake View adventure. My name is Courtney and I'm a naturalist here at Long Lake Conservation Center. Our adventure today is called Scientific Serpent Study, or SSS, or I like to say S because you guessed it. Today we will be studying and meeting the resident snakes at Long Lake Conservation Center. We will be studying the snakes like scientists. What do scientists do? Just think of some verbs, action words. What does a scientist do? The first things that pop into my mind are experiment, observe, ask questions, research, classify. I bet you have even more than that. We are going to use a whole bunch of scientists' verbs and tools as we meet and get to know native to Minnesota snakes. Now, just so you know, the snakes I have to show you are resident snakes at Long Lake. We have the snakes captive here at the center. We got them from breeders and they were only about this big and we keep them in enclosures and feed them. So they are not wild snakes, but we will be getting to see these snakes up close and use our scientist skills to study them. So before I take out our first snake and show you, I want to make sure we're all on the same page as scientists. And I want us to make sure we have our snakes classified and we all understand that classification. For that, we can use taxonomy, the science of naming. I'm sure you've heard of taxonomy before, right? You start with a big, broad category of shared characteristics. The biggest taxon would be a domain. And then we narrow in based on characteristics until we get to a species. So let's go through the taxon for a snake. All right, so we start big and broad up here. I'm doing this because in my brain, it's that upside down pyramid, right? A broad category and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So domain, snakes like humans, like a lot of life on earth, are in the domain eukarya because they are eukaryotes or they have membranes around their cell nucleus. It's pretty specific, but it separates different domains of life. After domain, we have kingdom. Snakes are animals, right? Not plants, not fungus, they're animals. After kingdom, we have phylum. Snakes are in the phylum chordata. And we can even specify the subphylum a little bit more and say vertebrates. So we still have that in common. Now, some of you might be like, whoa, I know what a vertebrate is. A vertebrate is an animal or organism that has a backbone. Snakes don't have backbones. That is a common misconception. You would be correct in saying that worms are invertebrates. They don't have a backbone. But snakes, you can see my skeleton here, are almost entirely a backbone of vertebrae. So we have our domain, our kingdom, our phylum. Now we are on to our class, reptilia. What makes a reptile a reptile? I bet you know. What's coming to mind? I'm thinking cold-blooded. Reptiles are cold-blooded. They regulate their body temperature from their outside environment. Now, if you were being quite scientific, you might even say ectothermic, regulating body temperature from outside, ecto, temperature 
thermic. All right? Reptiles also have scales. Yes, reptiles have scales, as opposed to mammals who have fur and hair, or birds with feathers. And reptiles lay eggs. So when we are studying our snakes today, we are going to be scientists who study reptiles. That would be a herpetologist. Herpetologists study reptiles and amphibians. So from reptiles, we can start to narrow down. After class, we have order. Snakes are in the order, squamata. After the order, snakes will start to vary based on their characteristics. There are different families of snakes, then more specifically genus, and then the most specific species. All right. So we're scientists, and we're about to study snakes or serpents. Now, what type of scientist studies reptiles again? A herpetologist. So you're all ready to study and practice like herpetologists. I'm going to introduce you to our first snake. Remember that we were classifying based on those taxon from domain down to the most specific. This is our first snake. Its scientific name, which is genus then species, is Thamnophis sirtalis. It is also commonly known as the common garter snake. This snake is the most common snake found in Minnesota. It lives in nearly all Minnesota habitats, including the 10,000 lakes. Maybe not all lakes, but it definitely can swim. So here we have our garter snake. And that's garter, G-A-R-T-E-R. We are going to use our science skills of observation first. I want you to get close up to this garter snake and observe for adaptations. Have you heard that before? Adaptation? An adaptation is an inherited trait or characteristic that improves an organism's chance of survival. So when we were classifying the snakes, we were using characteristics, right? From shared characteristics all the way to very specific characteristics. Let's look at those specific characteristics, those inherited tools that help this animal survive in its surroundings. Again, that's called an adaptation. So here, we're going to take a close look. What adaptations do you notice about the garter snake? Now, I can't hear all of your observations. I bet some of you are looking at the physical characteristics or traits. Others might be looking at some of the behaviors, what the snake is doing. One of the things that stands out to me about the garter snake is its coloring or pattern. These contrasting colors. Now, when I first learned about a garter snake, I thought that this contrasting color was a warning signal. Uh, the contrast, the warning, you could see it. But in fact, this marking is for camouflage. 
The garter snake blends in to tall grass areas. If you can imagine tall grass laying over creating shadows and the garter snake would blend right in. This would help its chance of survival, blending in or camouflage. Now, one of the other interesting traits or adaptations I have learned about the garter snake is what it does, so its behavior, in the winter. This is a native to Minnesota snake. It doesn't slither all the way down to Florida to <laughs> migrate and keep warm in the winter. Instead, it is a true hibernator. Unlike a lot of snakes, garter snakes are more social, at least in hibernation season. They group together with other snakes and sometimes mammals to hibernate. A group of hibernating animals is called a hibernaculum. Herpetologists have studied hibernaculums of tens of thousands of garter snakes. Why do you think they hibernate together? Why do you think they'd want to hibernate where a mammal is hibernating? Oh, I bet you're smart herpetologists and you know the answer to this. Because they're cold-blooded. They're regulating their body temperature and their adaptations of hibernating together are keeping them at least surviving the winter because they're not freezing through. By grouping together and coiling up around one another, they are keeping their bodies just warm enough. Now, if they were lucky enough to find a mammal's den where the mammal is constantly radiating heat because they are warm-blooded, that would keep this snake alive all winter long. How cool is that? Again, the garter snake, the most common snake in Minnesota. So far, we've been classifying our snakes using taxonomy or the science of naming. We've also been observing adaptations. And I would venture a guess that in your observations, some questions are starting to pop into your head. That's perfect. Scientists ask questions. They gather evidence and draw conclusions. Let's try all three of those things. So I am thinking someone out there is wondering if that garter snake or any snake in Minnesota is venomous. So we are going to use our evidence to determine if our next snake that I'm going to show you is venomous. Now, I do want to pause just quickly and make sure that we're all on the same page about what it means to be venomous. A lot of times people say poisonous when they mean venomous, but they are two different tools. So venom is typically injected or used by a predator to immobilize or kill prey. So it's used in a bite or sting, typically injected. Poison is usually excreted by an animal or organism to keep something from eating it. So venom is typically used by a predator to hunt and poison is typically used by a prey species to defend itself. So when we're talking snakes, there aren't too many species that are poisonous and we will generally use the term venomous or non-venomous. So, herpetologists have put together this collection of traits to help people identify whether a snake is venomous or non-venomous. Take a minute to look 
at the trades. These are general rules and they don't apply to all snakes, but some of these traits, being able to identify them would help you know if the snake that you are observing is venomous or non-venomous. So here are some of our data and evidence, our traits. Now I'm going to bring out our next snake. This snake is native to Minnesota. Now we've been classifying and observing and now we've been studying or collecting our data and evidence and we are going to determine if this snake is venomous or non-venomous. Again, that will take some observing. So recall the tool and the traits that indicate a venomous or non-venomous snake. Then take a close look at this western hognose snake. Your job as a herpetologist is to determine if you think the snake is venomous or non-venomous. So what do you think? Is this snake venomous or non-venomous? I'll tell you, this snake is in fact venomous. <gasps> now, I know what you're thinking. Courtney, you must be very brave. I would not hold a snake that could kill me. So this Western hognose snake does have venom, but it does not have lethal venom to humans. In fact, if it bit me, I'd probably only have a mild to no reaction from the venom. So when we're looking at all of the species of snakes in the world, about half have venom. Then about half of those are venomous to humans. This snake does have venom, but it is meant for its prey. I am not its prey. It also has really interesting adaptations to hunt its prey and keep from being prey for something else. So this hognose snake is rear fanged, meaning it has smaller grooved fangs and they're more towards the back of the mouth, not like a viper where they're up in the front. The snake prefers and commonly hunts frogs and toads. Now, if you've ever tried to pick up a toad, you may have noticed that they secrete toxins as a defense mechanism. This snake has special adaptations to counteract the toad toxins, use its venom, and easily hunt a toad for prey. Pretty cool, huh? Now, it's a predator for sure. But a snake this size is also a common prey item for things like owls, hawks, raptors, all sorts of things. So it, like the toad, has some defense mechanisms too. A few defense mechanisms. One, it could coil up. Maybe you've seen snakes do that before. It could strike but not necessarily bite all the time. They use their hog nose to hit 
hard. They expand their hood flat. They're trying to mimic the snakes in that viper family. You know, the big triangular hood look venomous and lethal. They also, in the right situation, will just play dead. They defecate or poop, regurgitate, throw up, and flip over on their back, showing their contrasting underside. So a hawk flying overhead would think it's a dead, smelly, unappetizing snake and wouldn't go through the work of hunting. And therefore, the snake defended itself and lives another day. Pretty cool. The last thing I can show you up close again, they have the pointy snout but it is their hog nose. They use this hog nose for burrowing, for digging underground and even digging up frogs and toads to eat. All right, herpetologists. So we've been classifying our snakes. We've been observing, asking questions, using evidence and drawing conclusions by looking at our garter snake and our western hognose snake. Now, I hope you're hanging in there. I know a lot of people have innate fears about snakes. Just something about them causes a fear or discomfort. But I do hope you're learning something too. Snakes are interesting organisms with interesting traits and adaptations. Not all are harmful to humans. I have one more snake to show you, another native to Minnesota snake. And this time, let's use all of our practiced herpetologist skills. Let's, <laughs> let's observe for adaptations. This time, really focus on the difference between a physical adaptation, a trait, like I have red hair, that's a physical trait, or a behavior, an action the snake is doing. We can also use our tool and evidence to determine if this next snake is venomous or non-venomous. And of course, keep the questions going in your mind. All right, so I'll get our last snake. This is the black rat snake. And I will come in close to let you take a closer look. Again, we're observing for those adaptations. Try to find a physical adaptation and a behavioral adaptation. Then we are determining if the snake is venomous or non-venomous. All right, so let me come in so you can get a closer look at our black All right, let's talk adaptations first. I hope you're noticing 
behavioral and physical adaptations. So physical adaptations of this snake. You can see she is black and dark in color. She has an interesting adaptation to help her blend in. That's physical. She has what we call counter shading, where she's dark on top and lighter underneath. This helps her blend in to her habitat. The black rat snake is arboreal. It dwells up in trees. So the counter shading works like this. The young snake up in a tree, way up high, if a predator is looking up, the light or the white ventral side blends in with the light. If a predator is looking down, the dark dorsal side blends in with the dark tree. Now, black rat snakes only have counter shading when they are in their juvenile or immature stage of life. Eventually, she will change color. You can see she's starting. And the bottom or ventral side will be completely black. She won't need the counter shading anymore because she'll have other tools, size and strength, to defend herself. Now, I bet you're noticing a behavior this snake is doing. And maybe some of you are even concerned for me. This black rat snake is coiling. Now, she's not wrapping very tight, but she is coiling around my arm. She is a climber, being arboreal. She is also a constrictor. That is how she kills her prey, by constricting around them. She's not constricting me to eat me. Snakes know their limits. They only eat and hunt what they know they can swallow whole. So I'm not prey for this black rat snake. Instead, what I am is something to climb, and I'm also a mammal, endothermic, warm-blooded, and always radiating heat. So she is just spreading her body out on my warm arm, and that way she is warming up from her outside environment. She'll have more energy and be able to be more active the warmer she is. You also got a close look and we were looking to see if this snake is venomous or non-venomous. This snake is non-venomous. Is that what you said? Yeah. There are only two species of snakes in Minnesota venomous to humans. And they're both rattlesnakes, the masasagua and the timber rattlesnake. And they are very rare to see in Minnesota because their populations are low. So in Minnesota, we're pretty lucky. We're not going to run in to, into any necessarily lethal snakes, or it'd be very unlikely. Instead, there are these non-venomous snakes in our Minnesota habitats, and they play a very important role in the ecosystem. They are a predator and sometimes prey. They keep our rodent populations in check, limiting disease and keeping balance in the ecosystem. They play that important role or have a niche in their ecosystem. Now, I want to leave you with one thing. I work at Lawn Lake Conservation Center. We're all about the wise use and respect of nature. Now that you've been observing and studying and investigating and classifying and asking questions about snakes, I want you to think about this. You're out on a trail on a sunny day and you see a long, big snake basking across the trail. They're just warming up. What are you going to do? Hopefully you have conservation in mind. 
Even if you feel a little bit of fear, the best thing to do is respect the snake and leave it be. You can walk the other way or walk around. In Minnesota, our snakes are not looking to hunt, bite, or strike you. They do not want to expend that energy. So leaving them be is the best practice and it keeps everyone safe. Well, herpetologists, I hope that you were able to learn something, observe something new, ask questions that maybe will spark some research. At Long Lake Conservation Center, we teach programs like this to groups with reservations. You get to see the snakes up close in personal. Sometimes we even use a different type of observation. Now, if safe for you, I'd encourage you to go outside, explore, conserve, learn about, and appreciate nature. Remember to be a steward of nature and to respect wildlife when you're out appreciating what nature has to offer. Thank you for exploring and learning with me. It's been an awesome adventure. Bye.